Hello, I'm Willie George. Welcome to this edition of the Faith Roots Podcast. This is Lesson 20. In this particular series, we've been talking about turning curses into blessings, and this may be the best story of them all. Nehemiah 13.2 is our text for the whole series. I've used it every week. I, I rarely ever do that, but this series, I did it because I thought this would be a great verse for you to memorize. How be it, our God turned the curse into a blessing. And this is not just something that he does. It is a part of his character. It's part of the fabric of who he is. Nehemiah 13, 2. So if that's the case, we see it all through the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments. We see it in the work of Christ, in his church. We see it again and again. All right, so we're going to take a look at this amazing story in the book of Acts, chapter 16. And Paul and his friend Silas and his co-worker Silas are in Macedonia by divine appointment. They had a vision calling them to go to this region. And so that would have created, I'm sure, a great deal of anticipation about the success that they would have here. And I think it's worth note to pay attention to that, that, that God supernaturally turned them away from six other places at the beginning of Acts chapter 16. And finally, they had a vision, Paul did anyway, about going to Macedonia. So they do go to Macedonia, and they're in the capital city, Philippi. And it says in verse 16, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling, meaning she had a demon spirit, who could tell her, she thinks it's her own knowledge, but he could tell her different things about people, causing them to think that she had some amazing gift from God. And uh, so the whole city was familiar with who she was. And she had masters. She was a slave girl, so they made a lot of money from her. This girl followed Paul and us. Paul didn't go after her. He didn't go to directly confront her. She followed him and his party during the whole time. And she cried out every time they went anywhere, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Another little nugget here. Uh, The angel said to Mary concerning Jesus, He shall be called the Son of the Most High. And it is interesting to note that whenever the term Most High God is used in the Gospels or the Book of Acts, almost always it is a demon-possessed person saying that. And it is not a praise. It is an accusation. And the accusation is we know that this person, Jesus, is from outside this planet. He's the Son of the Most High God. And that's why they said, have you come to torment us before the time? So this is an accusation. And it is an attempt to deceive people in Philippi to say to them that these two men are on the same team as I am. That's what the the girl is doing. And uh, whether she realizes or not, the demons in her did. Uh, So these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed. And it's, it's not his personal anger. This is his spirit within him turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. That word of authority I can only imagine. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that the hope of profit was gone, and something must have happened where she told them, I can't tell fortunes anymore. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace, which is where the judges were, Uh, to the authorities, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, and they were, uh, exceedingly trouble our city. Now, this is a racial statement. This is really an anti-Semitic statement. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans. They're making a big deal. These men are not Romans. We're Romans. They're not. And uh, they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into the prison, 
commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Not very good, is it? And uh, a seemingly uh, contradictory set of circumstances uh, concerning the vision that Paul had of a Macedonian man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Well, they did it, and they're probably thinking, we're going to have a great turnout here. And they did. They did have a great effect there. But they also had great persecution, so the devil was there to meet them. Sometimes God leads you to do something. Don't be surprised if there's not great opposition, especially at the beginning. You always see the enemy trying to stop something when it's in a babyhood state. Now, how do you respond to all of this? Well, here it is. Verse 25, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. Every man in the prison had an opportunity to get up and walk out, uh, but they didn't because the fear of God was all over them, because everybody in jail knew what Paul and Silas were there for. They had heard them singing, and they knew this was directly tied to them. And the keeper of the prison, waking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposed the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He's just going to do it before the authorities can kill him, because he's under a death sentence if he loses a soul. He is going to be killed himself if one of his people escapes. Uh, But Paul called with a loud voice saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now this, this word that he just uttered tells me everything I need to know about Paul and Silas. They made it very clear that they were here to tell people about how to be saved. Being saved was not something that the Greek population or the Roman population thoroughly knew and understood. In order for him to say this to Paul, he had to have heard Paul talking about the importance of being saved. And so that's why he comes back and says, what must I do to be saved? And so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Great verse, and I invite you to stand on that, especially if you have unsaved loved ones. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And all the prisoners are just back in the cell. Nobody left. It's just an amazing story. God certainly turned this curse into a blessing. And when it was day, and this is one of the favorite parts uh, for me, when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let these men go. So the keeper of the prison reported the words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. And now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Had Paul pressed this issue, these magistrates would have been killed. What they did, beating a Roman citizen with no trial, without hearing charges, without evidence, beating a Roman who is not treated fairly, was a death penalty offense. Paul was a Roman citizen. Just because you were in the empire doesn't mean you were a citizen of Rome. But because Paul was of Tarsus and his city, because of a kindness done to the emperor, was granted Roman citizenship, Paul was a Roman, knew his rights, and he could have hollered that out, but he allowed them to do it, and the whole thing flipped. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city 
So they went out of the prison, entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. And by the way, the church at Philippi became Paul's number one partner church. They supported him more than any of the other churches of the New Testament age. Now, amazing story here. Total flip of the script. And what I want you to see from this is Satan has some ideas of what is happening in the future. He has some, but he doesn't read the future because the Spirit of God's not in him. He can only sit back and watch and observe and try to forecast with his knowledge. Uh, he does not have supernatural knowledge of the future. So he sometimes overplays his hand. And that's exactly what you see with these magistrates. It's exactly what we saw in the crucifixion of Christ. The rulers who cried, crucify him, crucify him, all of them. Uh, King Herod, Pilate, all of them, Jew and Gentile alike. They all overplayed their hands. They went too far. There's a saying you ought to remember. If you give the devil enough rope, he will hang himself. And that is almost always the case, that when Satan goes against someone uh, and really, really goes after them and with a vengeance, and the thing turns and God works to turn it, the devil walks away thinking, you know, I probably should have left that person alone. I'll close with this. Uh, I live in the Tulsa area here in Oklahoma, and you can't live here without knowing how much our city was impacted by a teenage Oklahoma basketball player collapsed on a basketball court at age 17, was found to have tuberculosis. And this young man was supernaturally healed of tuberculosis. His life would have been cut short had it not been for the healing power of God. But God raised him up, and as a result of what had happened to him, he had an amazing passion to see sick people made well. God gave him an amazing healing ministry. Not only healing ministry, lots of people are saved as a result of his ministry. Today, the school named after him is doing better than ever. If you give the devil enough rope, he always hangs himself. And that certainly was the case with Will Roberts. Thank you for being a part of this podcast. I hope you'll join me next month. We'll pick up with another 20 lessons. I'll see you then. I want to thank you for watching our podcast today. And if you really liked it, would you please give us a little thumbs up by clicking on that sign down below? And then I would encourage you to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our future podcasts because they're all going to be good. And if you would like to support us financially, either with a one-time gift or recurring gift, you can do that by clicking on the link below or going to myfaithroots.com. Thank you so much for watching this program.